When an atheist writes a book mentioning the devil, it must be interesting. And if this person is the long time publisher of Skeptic Magazine, it must be fascinating. So today I'm honored and privileged to have Dr. Michael Shermer on my show. Michael Shermer is a publisher, the long time publisher of Skeptic Magazine, he is the author of many, many books, including Why People Believe Weird Things and another book that he wrote with uh, Arthur Benjamin, Mental Math. So mm. big, big, big fan. Michael, thank you so much for coming today to the show. Oh, you're welcome, and uh, thanks for the kind remarks. And yeah, that, that book by uh, Art, Art Benjamin and, and, and myself, he's really the mental mentalist, mathematical mentalist. Since you're a mentalist, you, you understand how that works. Uh, I, I'm just the scribe that helped write that. But uh, I appreciate you uh, holding up the cover of my first book, Why People Believe Where Things Actually. Um, the cover behind me, you see there on the door, that's the original oil painting for the original cover, which is up there on the shelf. Oh, uh, coming wow. up on 25 years uh, in two years. Wow. So, yeah, been wow. at this for a while. <laughs> okay, so anyway, uh, I, but I've I've been to uh, I've been to Israel twice actually. Yes. You have a beautiful beautiful country. Yeah. I I I think that we need to talk right now because uh, some of what of of what you mentioned in your last book of your most recent book, uh, giving the devil is due. I think is closely related to what's going on now in Israel with all the riots and all the uh, all the protests against the prime minister when the protests themselves during this horrible pandemic just uh, cancel every. Or, or ignore every piece of logic. And in the name of getting rid of our prime minister, they are making very, very serious mistakes regarding the health of many people. But we will come to, to this later on. Now, let me start with the first question because I just recently published my fourth book. I think that this is like a, a bad timing to publish a book during this pandemic, no? <laughs> well, yeah, my um, my last book, the Giving the Devil's Due, came out in uh, April, which was you know right. It was pretty much the week after the entire shutdown of all retail stores. So bookstore sales obviously plummeted. There were no sales, uh, but you know we thank thank goodness for Amazon and other online retailers. We gotta mention them as well, like Walmart, and Costco, and so forth. But um, yeah, we're living in strange times for sure, um, and. You know, the mask and social distancing, I, I think it matters. There's a lot of conspiracy theories I'm worried about um, that people therefore ignore just really basic uh, precautions uh, like social distancing and face masks. It's so easy to do and it's really not that disruptive. And, uh, and here in America, people are very confused about freedom. You know, they think freedom means I can do anything I want. That isn't what freedom means. <laughs> freedom means you can do anything you want within the confines of uh, laws and customs and mores and to what extent it affects other people. So people are accustomed to wearing, uh, seeing signs in American restaurants that say no shoes, no shirt, no service. Well, you just throw in face mask as well. What's the big deal? Uh, that's their right to do that. And, and you know, your right to swing your arm ends at my nose. You can't drive on the uh, on the left side of the road in America just because you feel like it. You're not free to do that. So, you know, it really gets back to political philosophy um, and, and uh, Thomas Hobbes and the Leviathan, which he articulated, not just him, but also Rousseau and Locke about uh, the social contract. And we give up lots of freedoms in order to be uh, more secure, safe, healthy, and so forth. So, all of civilization is about that trade-off between freedom and security. And we were seeing that being tested during COVID-19 uh, and conspiracy theories, you know, make it worse. I would even say though argue that Hobbes argument was that even the worst government is better than no government. This is one, what was one of Hobbes argument, but we are not in the worst government. And let me show you a, a, a picture that I got today on WhatsApp that says we don't believe in science anymore yes we have 
if you believe in science, if you deny science, if you don't understand science, and if you believe in magic. <laughs> so, That's really funny. So right. <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's crazy. So now let's start. Who is the devil and why should I give him his due? Oh, well, the, the metaphorical devil in my book title is uh, whoever disagrees with you, whoever you disagree with, <clears throat> whoever has, has ideas or thoughts or expresses them in speech that you find uh, offensive or wrong or immoral or whatever, we should give those people their due because uh, if we don't, then our own safety is at risk to have our own thoughts that disagree with the orthodoxy. You know, it's easy to be in, in, the, um, in the majority and denounce those who are in the minority position on any particular belief, religion, politics, whatever. Uh, but what happens when you're the unorthodox thinker, when you have an idea that you want to put forth that challenges the orthodoxy? What happens when you're the heterodox, the heretic, uh, so um, free speech laws and customs uh, are and principles really are there to protect the people who we disagree with the most, and so that's that's where the title comes from. And I'll 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 read to you the little passage where I begin the book, which is how this originally got started to be challenged in the United States a century ago in 1919 in the case of Schenck versus the United States. This is when uh, Supreme Court Justice ah, Freedom Oliver Wendell of speech, Holmes. you, you yeah. can't shout fire. I just read some of it. Yeah. Yes. But yeah, that's right. So here, here, yeah, here's his most famous pronouncement. <clears throat> the most stringent protection of free speech would not protect a man in falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing a panic. The question in any case is whether the words used are used in such circumstances and are of such a nature as to create a clear and present danger that they will bring about the substantive evils that Congress has a right to prevent. So uh, clear and present danger is, a, is, you know, the classic phrase used from there. What's the clear and present danger falsely shouting fire in a uh, theater. So what, what, what's he referring to here? Who is this shank? Charles Schenck was the head of the Socialist Party in Philadelphia, and he was promoting or distributing flyers to draft-age men who were being drafted by the government and sent to war in Europe. This was 1918 when, he, when Schenck was doing this. So this is when the United States got into the what now is called the First World War or the Great War at the time. And uh, the U.S. government um, imposed conscription. That is, we're going to take you and send you to war and, and, and Shank's argument was that that's a form of slavery. And according to the 13th Amendment, you can't enslave people. And now this is a debatable point, but, but th this is what um, was the court determined would be a clear and present danger. That is protesting the draft. I mean, that's crazy. <laughs> In <laughs> the, our standards today. Yes, but yes, of course. Right, exactly. I mean, you know, in the 60s, late 60s, people were protesting the draft. And, you know, protesting is free speech. That's part of, the, of, of our right to push back against government policy we don't like. And um, anyway, so the moment you create that category, that basket of, of items you're going to throw in there that uh, I think are a clear and present danger or you think are a clear and present danger, the problem with that is, Everything. Who gets to decide? Who gets to decide? And and pretty much anything could be considered a clear and present danger, if you know you think uh, that you're right and everybody else is wrong. So uh, that category has expanded over the course of the century to the point where now we're issuing my lists of microaggressions that people might find offensive, or that might hurt their feelings, and that's considered a clear and present danger. Therefore, they must be silenced. That's the problem. Let me tell you like a very concrete example from Israel. We are three days before Yom Kippur, which is the holiest days for the Jewish community all yeah. over the world. And now there is a, the government is planning to shut down all synagogues. But there is a question, should we also shut down the, uh, the right to protest? Because a protester against the prime minister mm. said, protest is much more important than synagogues. And I think that this is who get wow. to decide whether a protest in 
a democracy, in a, in a democracy is much more important than my Yom Kippur prayer at my synagogue. So it, it's going <laughs> right. right now yeah. in Israel. This is a very big debate now. Interesting. Yeah, I was not aware of that. Yeah, that's the problem. Uh, the moment you set up a rule like that, then somebody has to decide uh, which we're going to allow and which we're not going to allow and what the criteria uh, of judgment or assessment are and so forth. And so who's that? You, me? Uh, we set up a, a, a language police committee or, you know, and how do we enforce it? And, you know, it's pretty simple, like with protests when they turn violent. Uh, you know, violence in, in which there's looting and rioting and, and fires and, and, and theft and so on. Those are just crimes. So, okay, we, we, we'll stop that. That seems pretty clear. But just peaceful Not protests, that's speech. <laughs> Yes, like Seattle and Portland. It's, it's terrible. It's I mean, it's not really clear obvious. at all in Seattle to stop riots or to stop uh, robbery from Apple stores. So now, if, even now in, in, the, in the US, things that we thought was so, so obvious, yes, there is crime and we need to stop crime, what, wh however it can be done. Now we say, no, you need to cancel the police. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's the problem uh, with the far left. Now, uh, I want to make a distinction. These are not liberals that are doing this. These are progressives on the, sp on the spectrum. It's far, far left, so-called regressive left, but they call themselves progressives. But they don't believe in progress at all. They think uh, America has never been as racist and bigoted and backwards as, as, as in our history, which is completely wrong. So, True, li that's illiberalism when we're going to silence people and, and squelch speech. Uh, real liberalism is where you allow it. And so, you know, these words have become very um, uh, obfuscated and corrupted in the last 25 years or so, which is one reason I wrote this book was like, I'm really worried because my fellow liberals, I'm pretty socially liberal, well, fiscally conservative, but socially liberal. And uh, it's my fellow liberals on that front that have uh, that are mistakenly buying into this progressive uh, belief about free speech, uh, that it should be uh, tempered and, and squelched. And that's not liberalism. That's illiberalism. Real liberalism is you allow everybody and anybody to have their say. It's foundational because it's the only way we can determine the truth. So what we want is to know what's real, what's true. Uh, in politics, in religion, in science, in nature, whatever. And the only way to find out, it, because none of us are, are omniscient, we're not deities, so we don't know what the truth is. So we have to kind of grope at it through experimentation and testing. And that includes the marketplace of ideas where we debate uh, ideas like democracy or free speech or, you know, the military, the draft, whatever, uh, the face masks. Uh, you know, the only way to find out what's what's true is to talk about it. And, you know, all all's we have are our thoughts and our speech is the expression of our thoughts. So free speech to me is fundamental to all other rights. It's, it's the it's the foundation of all the other rights that derive from the from that. Now Michael, I hear your arguments from other uh, important figures in the U.S. like Dave Rubin, Dennis Prager for sure, Adam Carolla, Jordan Peterson, even uh, uh, Alan Darshowitz, Chomsky, etc. All the people that say, listen, I'm liberal, but all the progressive, all the people who claim to be liberal say, Pinker was, was, was I, I think, banished from, I don't know why, because he, he say, yes, that there are real physiological differences between male and females. And I, which leads me to your first book, because I'm a mentalist. Just a second. This is your first book. Okay. <laughs> <That's> not, okay. <laughs> now, now as, a, as, as a skeptic, you used to be against the orthodoxy, but the religious orthodoxy. Uh, we, you started, if, and please correct me, as a debunker of spiritualists, of mediums, of all this uh, claim to, to have supernatural powers, the, the Yuri Geller styles. But nowadays, it seems that you target your arrows not to the conservative part, because Dave Rubin considered himself as a conservative right now, and he said, all opinions should be heard. You target your arrows and you target your uh, words to the far left or to the left. Am I correct? Oh, I'm very critical of the, of the far right and conservatives as well. 
and I always have been. I mean, when I wrote Why People Believe Where Things, I have a couple of chapters in there about uh, critical of creationists, which is a right, you know, Christian religious right movement, and Holocaust denial, which is a far right movement. So um, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm now uh, targeting my arrows, as you put it, I like that metaphor, um, toward the left is, is, is because um, it's been corrupted by political correctness and this kind of woke uh, policy of illiberalism in the name of progress, but it's not progress, it's regress. So if it seems like I've, I'm giving a pass to conservatives, I'm not. <laughs> I, I'm still critical of conservatives. And even though, yeah, Dave Rubin and I are friends and Jordan Peterson and I, and I are friends, and I guess they're conservatives, although Dave calls himself a classical liberal, which I classical, do too. Classical, yes. They're, um, they're all yeah, classical, liber they're classical liberals, yes. Yeah. Now, Dave, uh, yeah, he does hang out with people like Shapiro and Dennis Prager who are uh, self-proclaimed conservatives. Okay, so, but let's make a distinction between um, policies that, you know, we may debate between liberals and conservatives, uh, maybe immigration or tax rates or abortion, something like that. Those are all debatable. Um, and, and so, but again, you have to have free speech. Uh, both sides have to be committed to listening to the other side and not canceling the other side if you disagree with them, but but counter them with better arguments. And if if you don't have very good arguments, well, too bad for you. Go get some, you know. So like at, um, the analogy I use at my class that I teach at Chapman University, Skepticism 101: How to Think Like a Scientist. I, these are freshmen; they're first year students, right out of high school, right. So most of them are pretty liberal. They're they're almost all uh, pro-choice on the abortion issue. So I asked them, you know, what, are, what do you think are the best arguments for the pro-life side? And most of them have no idea what the best, they don't even know what the arguments are. They just think, well, conservatives just hate women or something like that. Uh, by the way, I, that's I not an argument. By, by, by the way, after listening carefully to Dennis Prager, Ben Shapiro, and even Dinesh D'Souza, which worked heavily on this very subject, I still don't understand the most, the the best argument for poor life because poor life well their, all, their argument is that yeah their argument is, is that it's a living organism it's a it's a it's a human being inside there Dinesh, for example makes the argument that when when a woman gets pregnant and she wants the baby she talks about know. it I, like I, it's, i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry yeah. I, I got confused i didn't understand the argument for poor choice for poor life, I understand. Oh, for poor choice. Oh, for poor oh, choice. choice. Yes, and I even I even heard Ben uh, Sam Harris and say yes. After like it's all about how how many days into the con uh, from conception, because everybody yeah. is agree that like in the eighth month, it's like a murder. Yeah, that's right. In fact, in America, if a woman is let's say eight months pregnant and she's killed, uh, it's, it's a double homicide, right? So legally, so, but we're talking about two different things here. We have uh, uh, the kind of biological or scientific perspective on when life begins and you have the legal uh, perspective. So legally, you just have to draw the line somewhere. It's, co it's completely okay. arbitrary, right? So because we, to, to have a law, you have to, you have to define it, very op operationally define it specifically I and totally say, okay, agree after this date, yeah. Okay. Now, but of course, from a scientific perspective, there's no point at which life begins. It begins at the very beginning. You know, it never ended. It, be it goes back, you know, billions of years. And, uh, uh, but so, you, you know, we have a continuum in which we at some point have to draw a line and call it a category, a ca call it a category. So we're shifting from continuous thinking to categorical thinking. And this is the problem why it's such a contentious issue is because there is no place to draw the line. So usually, I think Dave Rubin also makes this point, he agrees with me largely on this, that, you know, when you when you can say something like not just the heartbeat, but uh, the neural networks are largely in place uh, by the, you know, 27th week, I think is the latest evidence on that. Then after that, you, you might think of it as a sentient being and therefore it would be wrong to kill it. And, uh, you know, most abortions happen long before that in any case. Okay, um, nevertheless, so, so there, I would say, that, oh, I, 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 I'm sorry, nevertheless, I would say that you have more in common in the way of debating those issues, even with Dennis Prager and Ben Shapiro, than with uh, Oxio Cortez, because they are willing to hear 
your arguments and answer with a better or less or less better argument. Yes, but we are today in the far left. We almost don't hear a rational argument. This is you are bad. Ben Shapiro had this book, Bullies. When the left disagrees with you, he makes you a bad person. And I think that you target, and many of your examples in your latest book are going through, going in this direction. The far left is not listening to other sides. Am I correct? Yes, that's uh, that, that's right. So that's that's all true. But let's not let conservatives off the hook. You know, conservatives say they're in favor of small government. No, they're not. They're in favor of huge government on things that they want, like military, police, uh, the judicial system, the criminal justice system. Uh, you know, they like to spend all the money they can and 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 raise taxes when they need to. Uh, so let's not let them off the hook. And okay. you know, conservatives say, well, we believe in individual freedom and autonomy. No, you don't. Because if you did, you'd let women make their own reproductive choices. Oh, no, that's different. We need to control what women do with their sexuality. Why? Well, because we're Christians or because we think, you know, life begins at conception or we think, no, oh, no, no, that's not a scientific argument. And that's not an argument in favor of freedom and autonomy and liberty. That's an argument to, that you want to impose your values on other people. And, and they used to make this argument about, um, you know, same-sex marriage and, and gay rights. You know, Republicans are only too happy to go straight into the bedrooms of two consenting adults and tell them what they can and cannot do with their genitalia, okay? <laughs> Conservatives are not in favor of liberty and freedom, right? That's why I'm not a conservative. And you we know, are going they into pick and classical choose. liberal thing. Now, I've made, a, I've prepared like philosophical question regarding your latest book. And a, so let me get it a, straight. Now, you try, you try to convince that a society is better off allowing freedom of speech. But it seems like the divide is so deep that some of the people most in need of your message don't see themselves as part of the same society as their counterparts. Uh, BLM, Black Lives Matter, for example. They want nothing to do with the other side, let alone build a society together. Now, maybe the situation is so bad that they just don't care. What do you think? Um, well, yes, that's, that's, that's a good way to put it. I think um, what people on the left, when they express their support for Black Lives Matter, they're signaling um, a commitment to racial equality which we're all in favor of, of course. But then the shift comes when they, when they emphasize equality of outcome rather than equality of opportunity. So the moment you shift, make that, that tra transition to what your criteria is that you're aiming for in society, that is to say, let's say there's 10% uh, blacks, I think it's 13% blacks in America. So you, you need to have 13% uh, programmers at Google who are black or 13% CEOs of Fortune 500 companies that are black and so forth. And the moment you set up that criteria and then you don't get those results, then what? Well, that's where big government comes in. And so here conservatives are against that form of big government and liberals are in favor of it. Uh, the problem there is that you're never gonna have a perfect uh, outcome because it comes down to what people actually want to do for a living, let's say, as careers and what they're good at. And, you know, and this idea that, you know, we should all be able to be whatever we want to be is, is nonsense. I, you know, most jobs that, that are available, I can't do, you know, and, and in my uh, li livelihood, I meet scientists from all fields and, you know, 99% of them I can tell are way smarter than me on what they're doing, and I, I would, I would have no chance of succeeding in being, you know, being a scientist in that particular field. That's just the way it is. <laughs> and so, uh, the the goal of a civil society should be to just lower the barriers and let people do whatever they want, and which, you know, no obstructions. Okay, which leads me to I think one of the hottest potato ever existed in uh, the American culture, the intelligence thing. Now, when you wrote uh, Why People Believe We Think Again, uh, you had Stephen Jay Gold as, the, as one of uh, forward by Stephen Jay Gold. He wrote the forward, the author, yeah. Yes, yeah. the author of 
the mismeasure, the mismeasure of man, which is an entire book dedicated to debunk another entire book, the bell curve. Now, I read with- oh, No, 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 that, 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 not quite. That's not quite right, no. Uh, Steve's book, uh, Mismeasure Man, was written, you know, 20 years before the bell curve. But Steve's book was written in the 70s. Bell curve was in the 90s. Uh, the copy you have there of Gould's book, it, you know, has, has an addendum in which he's critical of the bell curve. And I know Charles Murray was pretty unhappy about that. Uh, he felt that Gould did not um, give him a fair treatment. But that's a separate issue. Most of Gould's book stands perfectly solid because uh, the history of intelligence testing, it, particularly as it's... Uh, embedded in, in kind of a racist culture and these racial differences uh, in intelligence, um, th that was bad. I mean, everybody today who studies intelligence agrees that, you know, the stuff before, say, 1950s or whatever, was pretty corrupted by these kind of white supremacist racist attitudes that every, pretty much everybody held. So uh, I would defend Gould on that. I think where he perhaps goes too far is in more modern um, uh, a research on intelligence. The mistake everybody makes, I think, and you can see behind me the, the cover of the latest issue of Skeptic on, on, on race, because this is yet, yet again another contentious issue here in 2020. Um, people are confusing population and race. Race is a social construct, the, the word. What, what biologists study that's not socially constructed are populations, genetic populations of groups of people. So you can't say blacks are good at basketball and, and are, are better than whites at basketball, but whites are better at programming than blacks. You know, this is a nonsensical kind of way to talk about it because it's, it's populations. You know, so certain Harry populations of, of- Ethnic differences. It, it, it clearly doesn't say race, it say ethnic differences. But nevertheless, yes, we, well, but, but even, uh, but he, yeah, I, I, and I know Charles Murray, he's usually pretty careful, but like his latest book that I, I just read, Human Diversity, uh, the subtitle is The Biology of Gender, Race, and Class. Why did he put race in the title of his book when in fact he never uses race in the book? He uses he nothing to lose. populations <laughs> or ethnicity. So it's, it's, it's a weird thing. Again, this word race, it's so corrupted. West African populations are better at sprinting in track and field. Kenyan blacks are better at marathons. You know? and, and so you can't say blacks are X. Which blacks? And, and who constitutes, what constitutes a black? What if you're 80% black and you have in your you know, hi history going back generations, some white? You know, what, you know, how would you catch, so again, it's just so nonsensical. We're just talking about populations of, uh, of people and how they vary. And, and there's no question that populations vary, of course. And uh, so, but again, in, 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 historically, this word race is so loaded with emotional baggage that people, they just lose their minds talking about it on both sides. So I say, drop the word, stop using it. Talk about populations. Then that puts us in the realm of science. Okay, now let me go. Uh, my my third book uh, was that was published uh, exactly one year ago called Intelligence: The Unpleasant Truth, and uh, and okay, I what's did, the unpleasant truth? Ah, uh, there are a lot of unpleasant truths, and one of the unpleasant truths, I, I I would say that there are at least three unpleasant truths. Now you said your, yourself that you decided not never to research IQ, especially in the context of racial differences because such research can torpedo, it's your words, <laughs> one's career. Yeah. You also said that you encourage any researcher to pursue such a path because, as you put it beautifully, knowledge is what will ultimately set us free. Yes? Yeah. This is I wrote that, yeah, almost 25 years ago. I still stand by that. I think, if, if anything, it's even worse now in terms of torpedoing your career. It's very <laughs> risky uh, uh, to, to go into that field. And so those that do, you know, I'm glad that they do, and particularly those that are careful about talking about populations and not race, um, that's fine. And, but, but you know, in, in principle, yes, people should study anything they want, of course. Um, in, in terms of what I was interested in, I, I mean, the reason I didn't go into studying race and IQ, for example, well, there's a hundred other subjects in psychology I didn't go into. You know, I just study the things that I'm interested in and, and, and good at. So. 
uh, it wasn't so much that I was worried about ruining my career, I, although I, I just decided I'd rather pick other battles because clearly, I, you know, I, I've, I've targeted religion and, and politics, and that's been no less controversial and, and, yeah. and uh, you know, for my career. But anyways, um, yeah, so the, this idea, though, of unpleasant truths, I mean, you're saying it in a way that these these things are absolutely true and we know for sure X and therefore uh, we should be able to talk about it. Well, some of that's debatable. I have, I don't know what, what I haven't read your book, so, uh, but I'd like to read, yes, read yes, your book. Yes, I don't yes. know. Is, is it in English yet? Cause I'm, I'm, I'm afraid no, I don't read that. No. But I will, yeah. I, 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 I would say like, I think that there are three uh, or four uh, truth about intelligence. One, that there is something that's called intelligence and has, a manifestation in your brain. In other words, high intelligence people have different brain, yes, and you can see it using fMRI than low intelligence people. It's not a social thing, a social construct. It's not something, it's like, like Gould say, the G doesn't exist. One can see as a, a, a other neurological path with higher EQ people. This is one. The other is that intelligence is one of the most important factors in our society today. It's not the only one, but it's one of the most important factors. The other is that there are cognitive differences between men and women, male and females, and those uh, cognitive differences are massively uh, influence how our society looks like, okay? And the other that there are ethnic differences. And those ethnic differences is, I think, what divides the US for the last 50 years. Now, uh, let me quote Thomas Sowell, who said that at the beginning of the 20th century, all racial differences were regarded as explained as race, but now all racial differences are explained as racism. Now, everything that we see, that there is, it's not equal between whites and black and Hispanic. And by the way, it's not just white and black. It's the Asian that gets lower the uh, SAT in Howard and MIT because they are ev like on average 105 IQ points. So I think that this is a very important issue, a very important issue, mainly because we are in a secular society. And this is what I wanted to ask you, because if I am in a secular society, some people worth more than other people. Elon Musk worth to the United States much more than me, because he contributes more. So if you say, listen, there is no transcendent value to men, so yes, high intelligent people or, or uh, highly productive people are much more con are contributing much more to society, therefore, and this is a therefore, worth more. Would, would you agree? I, I, yeah, I guess no, see, well, you, you made a couple moves there. Uh, worth more, no, absolutely not. I mean, it, it, it's not clear that Elon Musk is worth more than Michael Jordan or you know, Joe the plumber. Right, I mean, that's a value judgment that you're making that is not quantifiable. Uh, in some objective sense, unless you say, well, um, electric cars are the most important thing anybody could ever do, therefore Elon Musk is number one, or something like that. Why is, he, why are, I have an electric car, I drive a Tesla. What, what, but, but I'm not gonna say electric cars are the most important thing we should assess as valuable to society. It's one of a thousand things that I think we should value, or, or a million things, whatever. Okay, and also, like, let, let's just take the example of gender differences in uh, cognitive abilities. There's so much variation, and there's so many different cognitive abilities. So the moment you drill down on any of those, like, you know, women have better verbal skills, men have better spatial skills. But even in that, you have to drill down more because there's multiple different kinds of spatial skills and multiple different kinds of verbal skills. And some of them, women are better than men. And, and but, but which populations of men and women are you measuring? And you say Asian. Okay, which, Asia is a pretty big place. Roy, which, which parts of Asia are you talking about? We talking about immigrants that came here to go to Harvard, 
Okay, that's not Asians. That's one particular population. You can call it an ethnic group if you want, but you know, but but when you again you drill down, and you go, okay, well they had a, a certain kind of upbringing, right? The parents have lots of books in their houses, and and, and they had you know lots of uh, early training, and a culture and a norm of academic excellence, right? If you don't have that, it's not it's not because of your genes uh, or some heritable difference in your ethnic population. It's because you were raised in an environment. Probably, you know, if we want to talk about, you know, African-American inner city uh, families where, you know, there's usually no father, right? There's few books in the house. They start reading later and, and, and it just escalates from there. You know, where's the genes there? Where's the heritability difference there? I mean, there, there's so many different factors you're talking about. And then if you want to pull back in terms of what's important in society, well, that's also quite arbitrary. I mean, again, there's, you know, 99.9% .9 of jobs that are available I can't do. I'm a pretty smart guy. I'm super hardworking. I was raised in an environment with, you know, dedication to being high in conscientiousness and responsibility and so on. And yet I still can't do most jobs. And, and that includes, you know, the electrician or the plumber that comes here. You know, I'm impre very impressed by what they could do. I can't do most of these things. So to place a value uh, on a hierarchy of like, well, Google programmers, Google programmers, that's the highest. And there aren't enough African-Americans or women doing that. Therefore, uh, on either side, left or right, you know, that, that we're making a value judgment. That's a move that I think is a mistake to make. Uh, I would say that this is a mistake to make because any person, and I'm a religious, I, I, I'm also, I'm an Orthodox Jew and a skeptic. So it's a mishmash. Okay? I teach. Wait, so you, do you, you believe in God? Yes. Do you believe in God? Yeah, yes, you do? Yes, but I don't believe God exists. Well, I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I teach, uh, I teach uh, the guide for the, uh, for the periplexed by, periplexed by, my, by Maimonides. So my yeah, notion yeah. of God is not the notion of Christianity, it's not the notion of the, the, Sistine, Ch the Sistine Chapel. Yes, it's, it, it, okay. it's a different notion of God. But yes, I am I'm, I'm a practicing Jew. But nevertheless, I'm very skeptic. I, I, I told you before, I'm a mentalist. So I think that most of the supernatural thing that we see are like hawks. Yes. I don't believe that yeah. Yuri Geller, many people ask me about Yuri Geller. You, you know, he had this uh, very big show in, in uh, Israel like 10 years ago. And they asked me, what do you think about Yuri Geller? And I say, I believe, I think that Yuri Geller believes that he has powers. And I truly think I'm so. not sure. I, I, are you sure? Because I, I, I follow this pretty closely. I think he knows he's a bullshitter and that he, you know, when he was bending spoons and, and, and all that stuff back in the seventies, he knew he was using magic tricks. You know, that, that's not self-deception. Like I could see mentalists. Like I had a friend um, who used to work the psychic friends network. He was a magician. He was a mentalist. And he told me, you know, I, most of the stuff I, I was doing cold reading, but sometimes I would get something and I'm thinking, you know, maybe there is, maybe there's something to this, you know, like ESP or something like that. And, you know, of course to me, it's like, no, you're just remembering your hits and you're forgetting the misses and so forth. But, um, uh, but, but so it's, I could see where like a cult leader starts off as a scam artist and then thinks, well, maybe I do have special powers, you know, because all these people are worshiping me. And, you know, I seem to know things that other people don't. Maybe I'm, you know, connected supernaturally. I could see how self-deception works that way. If we, you we do to, cold you reading start to long believe. enough, or if you do, if, if you yeah. are practicing cold reading long enough, eventually some of the guys will, will believe that, yes, I yeah. can. But not spoon bending. No, spoon oh, bending no. is different. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. But nevertheless, I'm skeptic. I know. And I, I know people, you know, at, at the end of my show, people come and say, could you give me a blessing or, or something like this? And I know that I have no special power whatsoever uh, except for placebo. So I know yeah. many people from the religious community say, listen, I saw this rabbi and he's amazing and et cetera, et cetera. And I don't believe any of this because I don't believe that the laws of physics ever breaks. 
I do believe, yeah. however. So why 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 even use the word why even use the word God at all? I mean, why not just say I'm a secular Jew or I'm a cultural Jew? Um, I like the customs and the traditions and the history and so on, but I don't believe in any kind of God. You know, I mean, unless you mean like Spinoza's, you know, the laws of nature. Uh, no, you know, like Einstein think, leaned on no. Spinoza. It, when you use when Einstein used the word God. It's Stephen Hawking too. He just met the laws of nature. It's just a word. Yes, definitely. It's not. It's not Spinoza. It's not Spinoza. And the first verse of Genesis said, "In the beginning, God created." In the beginning, I think, in the chaos. In the beginning, God created earth and heaven, which means we are not panatheistic. There is no panatheistic view of in Judaism. There is, so etc. But God is not nature. God is not the world. God is outside the world. Nevertheless, yeah. the yeah. notion of God is something that one cannot, a human being cannot grasp. I would say that I don't believe in God of gaps. I don't need gap. I don't need God to close any gaps that I have in my uh, scientific view or in my uh, scientific uh, research. Okay. God yeah. is not function it, uh, as something to solve the mystery of science for me. I think yeah. that God but is you're still you, but but you made another move there. Yeah. God is outside of space and time, outside of the universe. Well, how do you know? I don't. Uh, because he, he, you don't know. No, that don't. you just made that up. That's just an assertion. Right? So now usually when I ask Christians this, I they don't. say well, he I don't. I because he reaches in periodically. But what you believe? You said you believe in the God that's outside of space and time? Yes, but nevertheless, why? I, I, what do you mean by believe? What do you mean by believe? It's like I believe in the laws of nature. Okay. Okay, I, that's I fine. Believe, but that's that, that's I, not I God. Believe. That's I just the laws I, I, of nature. I, I'm not one. I'm not one hundred percent sure because ever since Popper, we know that the one thing that we cannot say is it's like the the structure of a scientific proof is that you only can prove prove that something is not correct you cannot yeah there's like the uh, yeah, black right, one right. yes yeah. right, like the best one right. now yes, i yes, i yes. am skeptic i i don't know whether the laws of physics are truly correct and ever since einstein debunked newton you know maybe the laws that we know right now are not correct but nevertheless i have the very strong feeling very strong clarity that we have that there is something beyond now i would say i would say that uh, in one of the, your recent interview uh, you said uh, the host asked you about meaning and you said there is no meaning we as human being we create meaning yes we create yeah. meaning yeah. and yeah. then he yeah. asked you uh, but this is artificial it is it is no meaning and yeah, then you yeah, said right. this is artificial but is but is meaningful to us because meaning is subjective am i correct that that's right but of course it's it's grounded in human nature and biology and so on yes, the, the things that yes, i find course. meaningful my dog's not going to find meaningful we're different species so it's species specific meaning let's call yes, it that yes definitely but not but, but, but not outside of the universe not outside of the world well, or outside of nature question, yes but my question is uh, and ever since i think the strange death of europe uh, pointed it very clearly when douglas mary said we have a secular culture in europe that deals with a very strong religious community or religious Islamic community. And when this artificial meaning is tackled or attacked by a, a fanatic Muslim who, who thinks that meaning is not artificial, meaning is very, very uh, concrete from God, one cannot win in this battle if you are a European. If your meaning is artificial, you, are not, you don't believe strong enough to fight for it. Would you say that yeah. this one of Mary's uh, ideas? Yeah, I like Charles. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, no, 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 um, uh, uh, but, but, but the counter to that is not, we need re religion on the other side to counter the Muslim. We need to say the Christian or the Jewish 
just call it the Judeo-Christian worldview, to counter the Muslim worldview. That's not the answer. The answer is secular laws and customs that say there is no absolute truth, because if there was, there wouldn't be multiple religions, and there's no way to find out which is the right one. There's no algorithm we can run. There's no experiments in a Popperian sense. We can falsify the Islamic worldview and confirm that the Judeo-Christian worldview is more likely to be true than the Islamic one because of the test. There's nothing like that for religion. It's less likely so the to only be. way to so the only way to, to to exist is to is to have this kind of freedom of religious expression. You can believe whatever you want. I can believe whatever I want. But we have laws and customs in place that says you can't enforce force yours on me and vice versa. I can try to convince you through arguments, but I can't force you. Okay, so that's the solution to that. Now. In terms of the battle of ideas, the solution to the this kind of relativism of the secular left, that there is no absolute meaning, anybody could do whatever they want and it's all equal. No, that's not true either, because we have a human nature that guides uh, what we find meaningful or, or, or what leads to a happy life or a meaningful s s existence and so forth. That, you know, I talk about that in <clears throat> in the book, the latest book is that uh, you know, it's not relative, it's not objective and absolute. It's not relative either. You know, it's guided. There's these sort of channels that direct us by human nature that we can discover through science. Okay. And we can, we can test it and, and so forth. Um, but, 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 but just go back to what you Muslim were saying before. Not, but the fanatic Muslims are not going to agree to this bank of ideas. And, 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 and if they are not going to agree, they're going to explode in, 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 in buses, just like happened in Israel. So my question well, is, to, you, there you're talking what, about, a, 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 that, that's a different problem. The problem is terrorism and violence. The problem is not their, their well, the problem is their ideas are wrong, but that's a separate thing. They can believe whatever they want. Uh, I don't care what they believe, as long as they don't blow up buses. If they're blowing up buses, then we have a problem of terrorism, and we know how to how to solve that. You know, we have some idea on that, but that's a different. I, I, issue. I think that Europe, I, but, I, but this is exactly Mary's point. Europe doesn't know how to solve it because a, it doesn't believe anymore in in its values, like the Western tradition, the classical, the big books, the the, the Judeo-Christian tradition. Europe is becoming more and more secular. Therefore, it 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 has no power, so weapon to fight this very, very dangerous uh, ideology. Murray himself said, I'm an atheist. I'm an atheist, but I need to act as if I believe in the transcendent values and the moral rights and, and, and the moral foundation of the Judeo-Christian tradition. Yeah, I, I find that said, kind of argument, I, I find that argument, first of all, wrong, but also patronizing and it's it's a little bit like, you know, I don't need belief in God, but the little people do, you know, they're so dumb, they're so backwards, you know, and, and, and they need, they need some kind of comfort or some kind of rules or that's bullshit, you know, no way. That's, that's treating people as if they're children, right? <clears throat> Anybody can understand uh, secular principles. You know, we just go back to Locke and, and, and Hume and Thomas Jefferson and, uh, uh, John Stuart Mill and Jeremy but Bentham Locke, and utilitarianism and so on. Secular. Locke Any, wasn't secular. Yes, Locke yes, but the, no, he, he, he I don't care what he personally believed. I mean Locke. his ideas. But Locke his said... His ideas. Just a second, Michael. Locke said in, in one of his writings, there is on tolerance, I think. I don't know how you translate on, on tolerance. This is one of his writings. In, because intolerance? He like, uh, there is in, uh, in, in Hebrew, it's called al Lanut. Or, or on being more patient about tolerance. I think this is a, one of his book. And he said, you need to be tolerant to, any, to everyone except from the atheist because they have nothing to lose. So it's... it's, it's, it's <laughs> See, it's there you go. To, Even Locke was restricted. Yes. But, but I'm talking about the ideas. I'm, I'm talking about the ideas of these, these men, not, not, not their personal lives or what they, they personally believe. That's irrelevant. Um, you know, and, 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 but you touch on an idea there of that, you know, 
that Popper identified, this is Popper's paradox, that, you know, in a free society where you tolerate everybody and you're not intolerant, then the intolerant people can get a toehold and, and, and get power and, the, and therefore uh, be intolerant of the tolerant people and therefore intolerance will win. Well, no, that's not actually what happens. Yes, you can find a few isolated examples in, even in the 20th century, uh, say Nazi Germany or, or, or communist Russia, uh, where, yes, that does happen. But in, in a free society where you have a free press and back to where we started, this is why we need to defend free speech. Because the only way that can happen is if A, you, you silence people and B, you, you, you lock them up and, and you enforce it through controlling the press. So you have a state media and, and, and you have uh, new norms that say people cannot speak up. Because when people can't speak up, they don't know what other people are thinking. And so you get this effect called pluralistic ignorance, where everybody thinks that everybody else believes that. So I guess oh, I'll go along nice. with it. Or I guess, yeah. So this I guess is... I can't speak up uh, because everybody else believes something else, even though they don't. This is the emperor's new clothes, right? You know, uh, everybody thinks, everybody's pretending that the emperor has clothes until the little boy says he's naked. And, and then people go, oh, I can say that he's naked because I can see with my own eyes, right? It's like so when in, in the case of Nazi Germany, life. in the case of Nazi Germany, um, this question I've, I've spent my whole career trying to answer, how is it that you can convert uh, a nation of intelligent, cultured, educated people uh, ensconced in Western values into Nazis in a couple of years? And the answer is they didn't. The majority of Germans were not national socialists. You know, they came to power without a majority. And the moment they got any kind of power at all, they, they took over the press, they silenced people, they set up the concentration camp system. You know, there were thousands of camps. We hear about Auschwitz and Birkenau and Majdanek and the big ones, but there were thousands in the KL system. And anybody who spoke up against the regime, and I'm, I'm talking here about early 30s, you know, 34, 35, 36, before the war. Um, you know, and so everybody could see that anyone who dissented uh, disappeared. You know, where'd they go? They went off, to, they, they were sent to these camps. Therefore, everyone kept their mouth shut, even though the majority did not go along with National Socialism, particularly the kind of exterminationists side of National Socialism. Um, and, and therefore, the whole thing floated in the ether for 12 years uh, because of the silencing of people's voices the silencing of the press and so on. So as long as we maintain in the West a free press and, uh, and, and support of free speech, again, this is why I'm critical of the left because that's not liberalism. The, the, the answer to tolerating intolerance is that you have to let people speak. And the moment you go the other direction, then, you're, that, then that sets up an opportunity for uh, intolerant people to take over. I think that we have so much in common. By the way, I, I must say that uh, there is another uh, theory re regarding the Nazi with Hitler willing executioner. I don't know how to spell it. That, yes, uh, I, I know Daniel Goldhagen's yes. book. I've read, I've read, and he I've said, read both like, of his books yes, carefully. Exactly yeah. the opposite. But I think that there, there is any person can convert it to anything with giving the right circumstances. And uh, like, let me let me ask you like the last question first thank you so much this, this was a mind-blowing uh, conversation in interview and please go and uh, buy fast the i uh, know not this <laughs> this is one now the other the last question that i would like to ask you is oh this is this is a book great book please come and uh, please buy it on amazon now let me uh, finish with my last question and it seems like 10 years ago or 15 years ago being uh, an atheist was like the only thing that you could be if you are a very smart and intelligent person we had the four horsemen of the uh, like we have sam harris and we have christopher hitchens and we have dennett and we have his holiness Dawkins, and you couldn't say <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this, uh, this I got from Rabbi Lord Sachs. Whenever Rabbi Jonathan Sachs mentioned Dawkins, he said, His Holiness Dawkins. <laughs> <laughs> and it seems to me that nowadays, 
after Peterson and even Dave Rubin, which was, he said, I'm an atheist. And after a year of lecturing with Peterson said, I think and changed my mind. So, so it became more, more prevalent. Yes, it's an option to be an intelligent and, uh, and a believer. And I think that Jordan Peterson with his biblical uh, lecture made the huge differences, a huge difference in, in this approach toward religion and the Bible. Would you consider this as well? As, as a well, uh, the, I'd say the way you phrased it, yes, <clears throat> uh, culturally, maybe it's a more defensible position, but what's the it? Uh, what is it you're believing? You know, when you push Jordan on this question, uh, you know, he's not, a, it's not at all clear that he believes in, in, in a personal God. Uh, I mean, what most people mean by God is a, a you know, a personal being, a, 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 an agent that is conscious in some way, that, 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 that knows we're here, that, that, that exists, you can pray to, and, and so forth. This is what most people mean by God. And when you push Jordan on this, it's not at all clear that that's what he believes. Now, he may say uh, it's okay for other people to believe that or people need that, whatever. I'm not talking about that. You know, it, it's like I you know, think Dan makes the point of the, uh, Maybe. <laughs> I don't know about that. Yeah. Same thing with Dave Rubin, you know, uh, and even you, uh, Roy, you, you made a comment earlier, maybe 10, 15 minutes ago about belief. Well, what do you, what do you mean by belief? You say, I would say, I mean, and here I would are, like, okay, yeah. this is good. I, I think that uh, being atheist is very nice. And there is like a joke that an, a dead atheist is one who dressed up very well, but has nothing, has no place to go. But it's not about <laughs> yeah. afterlife. Okay. I don't believe in afterlife, okay? I don't believe in afterlife. Okay. Even if afterlife exists, it's not me with my memories that goes up, okay? Yeah, yeah, God yeah, must, yeah. when I dead, God <coughs> format and reset the SD card, the SD card is going up blank, okay? This is what I believe. It's not about afterlife. It's not about hell. Well, hell that is, is the original Jewish c conception of, yes, of heaven. Yes, to go. I'm an orthodox. I wrote about that in uh, Heavens on Earth. I wrote about that. Yes. So, but I'm not talking about the afterlife. No, you okay. said... Yes, you, yes, yes, yes. I will, I, 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 will tell, I will tell you this. I believe that, and this is like the, uh, it, it's not about... Uh, it, it's, it's not about Judaism, yes, but, but this is what I believe. I believe that the uh, most problematic point with, I, with atheism is, the more, is what is the foundation of morality. If you ask Sam Harris, and I heard Sam Harris many times, it's rational. You, some, you, you, I heard this uh, conversation with Prager, and Dennis Prager told him, I believe murder is wrong, and you also believe murder is wrong. I believe murder is wrong because God told me so. Why do you believe murder is wrong? And he said, if you talk with your neighbor, you will get to this conclusion. This is what Sam Harris uh, uh, said. Pinter no, no, said, no, that, not, that wasn't Sam. That was me and Prager. You no, saw, no, 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 no. Sam never... There is, I will also... <coughs> there is you, but there is also... There is a, there is a radio... A, a radio show with Sam Harris and Dennis Prager that Sam oh, Harris I that. wanted. I, I, I will send you at the end of, and I will put link in the description, Sam Harris and Dennis Prager. Now, Steven Pinker said that it's about evolution. We got, the, we got our morality from evolution. I think both of those uh, arguments are false. We need, I need God to have an objective, transcendent, Thing that this is true without without this outside transcendent nothing can be regarded as true i think i need god to uh, for the foundation of my morality i don't say that really Sam Harris because is not uh, <clears throat> how do you know what god thinks is right or wrong oh this is nice and by the way in in the jewish literature we say it doesn't matter <laughs> what God thinks. Well, well, it matters epistemologically because you have to get it from somewhere. You got it from reading the Bible or from the Torah or from your rabbi, your parents, your culture. Those are sources of knowledge that are not 
objectively reliable. There's, they have uh, certain values in, in, in cultural context and historical context that Absolutely. maybe they're right. Maybe they're wrong. There's no way to know. So in, uh, unless you're talking to God directly through prayer or the inner voice in your head or whatever, but even that's not reliable because we know people <laughs> hear voices. <laughs> and we know people you know, in prayer, they can talk to the, you can talk to the dead all you want, but the dead can't talk back, right? So talking to somebody, that's not a source of reliable knowledge. Now, as you know, Plato debunked this idea way back with Euthyphro's dilemma, you know, that, you know, why do we need the middleman at all if there's these true objective values that are out there in the moral ether somewhere floating around, you still have to access them somehow through the Bible or whatever. And uh, so if they're really there, what do we need God for? We just go discover them ourselves. On the other hand, uh, I'm not a cultural or moral relativist. You know, we're not just making stuff up. So you mentioned Pinker. What he's talking about there is what's an area called evolutionary ethics, right? So there's certain, uh, what we're trying to explain is why we have a moral sense at all. So that's what you need evolution for, a sense of right and wrong about certain things. And that's constrained by our human nature. Now, that, but that's explaining, you know, the origins of our moral emotions. That's not explaining what's right or wrong uh, objectively. There you make the shift from, say, biology and evolutionary theory to philosophy. So this is why we have Kant and Hume and, and utilitarianism and, uh, uh, you know, a, a Aristotle's virtue ethics. And we have John Rawls's theory of justice and, and so on. There, there, and, and there's no one one, there's no one theory that has emerged as the correct one. Like, you know, it wasn't clear that Einstein was right. Uh, but, you know, a, after about 10, 15 years, you know, his theories have been tested. It's like, okay, he's right. There's nothing's going to emerge like that uh, in, in, um, the philosophy of ethics and, and morality, except for a handful that have survived. So, you know, if we were to if we were to have a collection of people from around the world, from varying cultures and religions and political beliefs and so forth, there would emerge a, a certain common element uh, that that even religion discovered. Something like the golden rule. You know, no, I can't to, for me to, well, I, for any any rules that you give me, I would find you people in, in different cultures throughout the world that says, no, this is not the case for me. Every people, like, take like the most simple one, for example, one should not murder without a decent cause, okay? I, one should not murder without yeah, a decent right. cause, okay? But right, what right. is a decent cause, okay? Now, and you won't find any moral value or moral principle that agreed upon everyone. Okay, let me read to you my defense here from my book of this uh, idea of where this comes from. Um, okay, so here it is. <clears throat> Excuse me. It is my hypothesis that in the same way that Galileo and Newton discovered physical laws and principles about the natural world that really are out there, so too have social scientists discovered moral laws and principles about human nature and society that really do exist. Just as it was inevitable that the astronomer, Johannes Kepler, would discover that planets have elliptical orbits, given that he was making accurate astronomical measurements, and given that planets really do travel in elliptical orbits, he could hardly have discovered anything else. Scientists studying political, economic, social, and moral subjects will discover certain things that are true in these fields of inquiry. For example, democracies are better than autocracies. Market economies are superior to command economies. Torture and the death penalty do not curb crime. That burning women as witches is a fallacious idea. That women are not too weak and emotional to run companies and countries. And most poignantly here, that blacks do not like being enslaved and that Jews do not want to be exterminated. Why? Just ask them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the reason that we know that uh, slaveholders knew that slavery was wrong is because they had to use chains to keep them down, right? The fact that slaves tried to escape tells us they want freedom. That's part of our human nature, and that's why slavery. So I will say slavery is objectively wrong. It's objectively immoral. It's not just some cultural trend that we happen to embrace in the 21st century and you know maybe next century everyone will love slavery including the slaves i don't think so any more than i think that uh, you know to use uh, my other example in that essay on you know okay the, uh, but nevertheless since i've studied that 
First of all, Michael, I, now I, I'm sure that you are not a skeptic. You are a believer. This is a very good <laughs> and a very strong yes, belief. Yes, well, that's right. I, be, I, the, I do believe lots of things. Sure. <laughs> okay. Now, but based what on, about, Based on evidence. But give me a... I, I think that the, the, the weakest point in the argument is that I would say, okay, people uh, don't like being enslaved. This is something that I totally agree with you. But nevertheless, still today, we have cultures and we have places uh, in planet Earth that enslaved people. So this moral principle that you give me, which is a very important one, doesn't count to all societies. Uh, yes, and, it does. And, the, the, yeah, the slaveholders, of course, embrace slavery, but not the slaves. But why Just do like the I would say. Holders? So if the slave, well, because this yeah. is what well, this any more is, than even any more than women want to have their genitalia mutilated, the women don't want that. The girls don't want that. It's the it's the adults. It's the culture. It's their corrupted religion that's driving that. It's their attempts to control female sexuality that goes way back in our evolutionary path. But that 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 doesn't make it morally right. It's morally wrong. How do you know? Ask the affected people. Not the moral doer, but the moral receiver, the recipient of the action. That's who you have to ask. I call that the ask first principle. Okay. Okay. Now, <laughs> this is, uh, uh, but uh, I, 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 will, I will tell you uh, just a second. Let me. Uh, <clears throat> so while you're thinking, my, my point is that, uh, we can have a form of objective morality uh, based on reason and science, human nature, and so on. It, and it's it's transcendent in the sense of it's not just me or you and our or, or Western culture, or American culture, or Israeli culture, whatever. It's it's human nature. We get it as members of our species, and to that extent, it's transcendent of culture. And therefore, objective in in a sense, it's not. You don't need you don't need an ex external supernatural source of morality and we know even if you did it's not there because there is first of all there's no god and second of all even if there was how do we know what god thinks you know so well we have the holy book well which holy book because the holy books conflict with one another so which is the right one and therefore and, and, they, and then you run into a problem i i oh okay so first of all okay so let me summarize it and uh, i would say that the one thing that i have to say uh, in my defense I, I don't know if my defense is, is is different than your defense because i i i, I truly think that there is an inherent moral sentiment within uh, every one of us and i think that this yep. moral yep. sentiment was uh, is uh, is divine, and because if it's not divine, again you give you gave many examples of things that we now consider to be corrupted and wronged, but nevertheless those things still exist and existed throughout history and exist now. What do you mean by divine? I mean that it's outside the bio outside the biology, outside the biology and. Uh, like Roger Scruton said, that there is no, something different, which is inherently different in 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 men than in the than the most sophisticated ape. I, I think that there now, is no, so. So if you're if you're talking bad. about moral values, do, do you mean like logic or mathematics? It's outside of uh, of the physical realm. No, it's, it's like a platonic I, no. ideal, like no, no, no. truth or I beauty. Believe, I believe. I believe that 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 you can't you can't do a reduction of morality uh, you can't do a reduction uh, of morality to rationality you can't derive uh, out from an ease you can't derive what right and wrong from your logic and i think that sure you can i i just did it for you you just ask no, people do you want to be enslaved but, no i don't <laughs> I, this is a very wishful thinking, and therefore I told you that you are a believer. And I, 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 I <laughs> I'm a I, believer in, in objective moral values, but 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 by objective, I don't mean external to human nature, supernatural, outside of 
biology or whatever and culture it's 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 part of us but it's but i mean it's part of our species so it's not just arbitrary you me the west whatever okay yeah yeah yes yeah. i'm sorry ken yeah please go okay now well <laughs> Again, I think that uh, the most important conclusion from our uh, mind-blowing uh, discussion is that free speech is like the most important thing. And from ever since John Stuart Mill wrote on liberty and said that we have four reasons why free speech must be because A, I might be wrong and you might be right. B, I might be partially wrong and you might be partially right. C, I might be right, but you saying your opinion is making my side even much more uh, uh, much more solid. And fourth, any truth that need a, a police to be truth is much less convincing. <laughs> so yes. from, from John uh, Stuart Mill on liberty to Michael Shermer last uh, giving the devil his due, I... <laughs> First of all, I hope that you will get uh, to say this uh, well on the Bible Belt because, like, this is like a, a, a good <laughs> yes, well, a book right. in the Bible. Belt. Well, thanks for putting me in that uh, good company. Uh, John Stuart Mill has been a lifelong hero of mine. Yes. So, Michael Shermer, Dr. Michael Shermer, is the author of uh, of many, many books, and including this. Uh, why people believe we think you can't be a mentalist if you don't read this book. And after you, <laughs> I think you can, but I appreciate the plug anyway. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Roy. Thanks for Thank having you me. So much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much.